We want to thank Harborview for hosting us here. It's uh, well known not just for trauma care. The goals of our meeting are, uh, we'd obviously like to try to update you on the assessment of deformity, update uh, you on treatment options, in which there's some very exciting things taking place. We very much would like to try to link pediatric and adult uh, spinal deformity perspectives, which has been an elusive problem, and discuss controversies with your help. Uh, this introductory re remark could also be identified as scoliosis, scamnum, or succussion. I think this mysterious phrase uh, uh, warrants a brief explanation. If we talk about scoliosis, over the history of time, humankind has been uh, somewhere vacillating between fascination and revulsion, as evidenced by the Hunchback of Notre Dame and Venus de Milo, who I insist had idiopathic scoliosis. As we look at patients, again, we see the same reflection of differences in patients uh, in quite a dramatic degree. And if we go back to the uh, words of a well-known physician, uh, he stated that there are many varieties of curvature of the spine, even in persons uh, who are in good health, for it takes place from natural conformation and from habit. And that was Hippocrates himself around 400 before Christ. If you look through history, again, back in ancient uh, Hindu texts, uh, uh, Lord Krishna was said to press down on feet and pull up on the chin uh, to correct scoliosis and apparently turned uh, women who are crippled into beautiful young ladies. Um, the outcomes were uh, fantastic. The long-term follow-up, however, was unknown, a practice that pervades modern medicine. If we look at the scamnum uh, aspect, that was a treatment suggested by Hippocrates, who we talked about before, a uh, basically lengthening table. And uh, the debate at the time was uh, the succussion, which was basically strapping a patient upside down and shaking them uh, until their spine straightened out. So uh, Hippocrates is credited with having damnified the succussion therapy. Uh, sadly, spinal deformity therapy for over 2,000 years has basically stayed in the scamnum or succussion argumentation. It has not gone very much further. And uh, most patients were basically treated with ignoring the disease process. And unsubstantiated treatments pervade it. It's only over the last 50 years that we actually have had the chance and the power and the gift to change lives by straightening people out again. And it is a true gift uh, that has brought us into many evolutions where we can actually recontour a spine into physiologic parameters now. We're far from being perfect, but it's a drastic change. Sadly, in the evolution, we've split between pediatricians and adult surgeons, and this is a chasm that persists up to the present date with some difficulties uh, as we don't communicate very well with one another. However, if we look at patients, it's a human continuum that we'd like to somehow bridge. And so if we go and uh, take this title further, hopefully this will be a session that leads us beyond scamnum or succussion, where we encompass all the phases of mankind as shown in this picture on the left-hand side, from youth to intermediate to aged uh, people. So I'll turn over to the moderator, Randy. Good morning. I think we've got an excellent faculty, and hopefully uh, during the discussions here, we will have uh, time to interact. And then also, one of the nice things about the, the labs at the end is it's a great time to talk about things while you're doing the procedures, while you're interacting with your teachers. Uh, it's a great time to ask questions you've been wanting to ask and get to know the, our faculty. Um, I'd like to kick things off here and welcome uh, James Wilson McDonald to come up and start things off this morning with thoughts on the etiology of kyphoscoliosis. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come to this meeting. It's very exciting and uh, I think I'm going to enjoy it very much. Um, I've been asked to start by talking about the etiology of scoliosis. I think if we'd uh, had this talk 10 years ago, we'd have uh, had a very short talk and there's certainly been some more information come available over the last 10 years. First of all, what are we talking about? What is it? Um, it's a combination um, of hyperlordosis, lateral curvature, and rotation, and of course it's mainly the rotation that the patients don't like. So uh, if we look at the, um, at the bending film, we see a typical rib hump, um, the patients overall in balance, maybe slightly off balance to the right. And when we look at the side view, it looks as if we've got a very kyphotic patient, but of course the spine itself is hyperlordotic. And if you look at most patients, almost all patients with idiopathic scoliosis, that part of their spine will be hyperlordotic. If um, you, this is a syndromal child who had a posterior fusion many, many years ago. And this is almost an experiment because here you have a posterior fusion and of course the anterior spine goes on growing. And the effect of that is that there's nowhere for this spine to grow to and so it rotates round and you end up with this enormous rib hump uh, as seen here in the patient. Again, look how lordotic 
the spine itself is. Um, if you look at the, uh, the pattern of, uh, of, of spinal shape, patients with scoliosis have a very low kyphotic angle. Uh, and patients with Scheumann's obviously have a very high kyphotic angle with normals somewhere in between. If you look, we know that uh, idiopathic scoliosis is much commoner in girls. And if you look at uh, girls, um, they're growing at a time when their spine is relatively lordotic. Whereas if you compare that with boys, boys have their growth spurt at a time when the spine is becoming increasingly kyphotic. And that may explain the high instance of scoliosis uh, in girls and the high instance of kyphosis in boys. Here, this is just a reproduction of what you've just seen with the girls stopping their growth much, much earlier than the boys. Um, if you look at the spine, you can show that um, there is very high pressure um, over the, air, over the uh, convexity of the curve, which is exactly what you would expect logically. And this may be one of the drivers which makes the curve progress in the long term. So if you look at the, as the scoliosis progresses here, you can see that there's a very high area of pressure on the concavity. And we'll talk a bit more about that later. So this is a very simple model, um, which really helps to explain why you get scoliosis. At the front of the spine, you have a, a bar, and at the back, you have a tension band. So in the neutral position, you have no curvature. But if you lengthen the front, you can see you start to develop a lateral curvature, and you start to develop rotation. Uh, and then if you increase it, the rotation and the lateral curvature becomes greater. And if you take an oblique view of this part of the bar, it is in fact lordotic and not kyphotic. So a very simple model helps to explain what's going on. Now there have been a number of uh, investigations over the years trying to explain why scoliosis occurs. Here's one where they looked at the musculature in the spine and they found that the mal multividus was much shorter on the concave side with more slow sw twitch fibers. And their conclusion was that this explains, this may be an explanation of why scoliosis develops. I think equally it could be, an ex it could be a result of the scoliosis rather than the underlying cause. We look at uh, biomechanical and neuromuscular factors. Um, there is evidence that there may be a defect in neuromuscular control and that biomechanical factors then go on and, and affect progression. It's been known for many years that if you take the pineal out of chickens, they will develop scoliosis. And it's thought that this is due to the uh, melatonin levels in the blood. And this group took three groups of chickens, and they either gave them melatonin, serotonin, or control. And in the control group, there were much higher levels of scoliosis. And when they looked, uh, when they actually measured the melatonin levels, they were lower in the um, chickens with scoliosis. So, it may be that this is part of the control of spinal growth. Um, other, other people have looked at the actual shape of the spine. Um, Burwell and his co-workers in Nottingham uh, were of the view that you need coronal asymmetry in order to drive the scoliosis. They pointed out that it's not a kyphosis, it's a lordosis, and it's the opposite of Scheumann's disease. Whereas Dixon and Milner um, in Leeds uh, felt that it was nothing to do with coronal asymmetry and that the driving factor was the lordosis with the spine buckling, as I showed you in that second uh, syndromal child with the posterior fusion. There have been other studies looking at the neurological function of children. Uh, for example, this study looking at um, labyrinthine function. And they found that um, the children with scoliosis had a, a very high instance of uh, nystagmus around 50% of them had nystagmus, whereas in the control group, about 2 or 3% had nystagmus. And they looked at the caloric response uh, of, of, of the labyrinth and found that there was a significant difference on the side of the scoliosis. But they, they weren't sure whether this was a cause of the scoliosis or whether it was the effect. And then finally, the people who looked at the modeling of the annulus fibrosis and have shown that there is asymmetry in the annular fibers, and again, it's thought this could be a driver for scoliosis. I suspect it's, it's probably a result of the scoliosis rather than the underlying cause. 
Uh, there was a, a, a paper at the uh, SRS recently showing that um, if, you, if you put pressure on the spine of a rabbit, you can induce a typical scoliosis. Jeremy Fairbank, my colleague who um, was here uh, last year, um, has done uh, intradiscal pressure measurement in Id idiopathic scoliosis. And what they've found is that on the concavity, the pressures are very high indeed. Uh, of course, this is probably effect rather than underlying cause. Um, and th their conclusions were that um, disc, uh, disc cells probably respond very sensitively to pressure changes and that proteoglycan and collagen synthesis uh, may well be um, altered because of the, the, uh, the mechanical environment which the disc uh, is in. And their conclusion was that this could lead to matrix changes within the disc and to wedging and progression of the deformity. And that asymmetry might make this quite a lot worse. I think some of the most exciting uh, developments, though, now are in um, <coughs> identification of different chromosomes which um, have been um, linked to scoliosis. And there are now about nine or ten chromosomes which have been shown uh, to be linked to scoliosis in family groups. Uh, this is just one of them. This is a study from last year where they looked at 202 families uh, where there were two or more individuals with idiopathic scoliosis. And they found uh, a genetic marker uh, on chromosome 19. And many other chromosomes have been implicated uh, in the development of scoliosis. This great study from Ward looking at uh, Central America uh, looked at the Mormon population. And the Mormons came over from the United Kingdom in the 1500s. And they, they, they reckon that there are 18 million ancestors. And since 1900, there have been 3 million descendants. And they were able to look at this, uh, this, this group. And what they found was that there were, there were an outlier of individuals who were affected with scoliosis. This, they, they, the estimate is that there were two families responsible for the development of, um, of, 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 of scoliosis. And that 70% of them have common ancestors in England. One, one single family had 28,000 descendants by 1920. So you wonder if it's not a fertility gene as well as a scoliosis gene. Um, and what they found was that scoliosis patients had a tenth, at least a tenth degree relative or closer with scoliosis, whereas controls had um, an 18th. You had to look 18 generations or 18 cousins away to, to find um, a, an affected individual. But it's, it's a heterogeneous um, condition, and so that makes the research difficult. And there was what, there's one other study, which I think is very interesting, looking at congenital scoliosis rather than idiopathic scoliosis. And even in this group, 20% of the families reported an individual with idiopathic scoliosis. And I think that's very difficult to explain. So we look at uh, the development. We have marked anterior overgrowth. The scoliosis develops by buckling. Um, you have two linked columns, as I showed you in that very simple model. And the growth is driven by growth plates. And the soft tissues simply respond to tension, and you have balance normally. The initiation is um, probably in the growth spurt when the kyphosis flattens, and the anterior column outstrips the posterior column. And the precipitating events probably a very rapid growth in a tall girl with a family history. There may be neurological or mechanical effects. Um, and if we look at scoliosis, small curves can get better because um, the spine can remodel. Larger curves, though, tend to progress. And uh, what we want to try and develop, and I'll talk about this later, is um, a balance between growth and, um, and tension and try and um, make the spine respond more normally with uh, our treatments. It may be that we can find a genetic progression marker which will tell us which individuals are going to progress and which are not. So we look at um, growth. We have physiological growth. Normally, the, 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 the skeleton likes compression and will grow faster. It doesn't like tension. But then if you look at the pathological um, stage, when there's a severe deformity, a lot of tension will make the, the, uh, the bone grow more, and a lot of compression will stop it growing um, completely. So what we want to do is to try and push the spine back into the physiological area. So in summary, Scoliosis is a torsional deformity of the spine. It's probably caused by asymmetric growth. 
I think in the majority of cases it's probably genetic, although we're not sure about that at the moment. And there are about a dozen genetic alleles which are implicated in the cause of scoliosis. And there are probably many pathways of pathogenesis. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now move on to uh, bracing for spinal deformity, um, kind of coming full circle here into some of the ideological uh, 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 causes of progression and deformity. Uh, Dr. Rooney, thank you. In a general sense, a natural history uh, has been pretty well studied in the literature. Uh, the science isn't necessarily very good, but what we've been able to determine is that the curve magnitude, uh, the amount of remaining growth, and the curve pattern are really our uh, best we can tell are predictive uh, factors for progression of curves. Uh, so what is progression? And we know that three to four, maybe five degrees of measurement error in the Cobb angle uh, is pretty standard. So anything less than that probably wouldn't necessarily constitute an increase. So in a general sense, again, uh, with bigger curves, curves bigger than about 20 degrees, five or six degrees of an increase is, is usually considered an increase in the curve. And for bigger curves, I'm sorry, for smaller curves less than 20, usually about a, a 10 degree uh, increase is considered an increase in the curve. So from all of our natural history data, really what still stands uh, is the standard, uh, is this from the Launstein Subtle in 84, and it's based on the Risser grade and the curve magnitude. And this is still on the board uh, questions uh, for the variety of different boards. Uh, it's the in-service answers usually, and this is a, a pretty useful guide for trying to figure out which curves are going to progress uh, in which patients. But what is important is that these are just statistics and individual patients need to be treated individually. So bracing, the history of bracing started really with Milwaukee brace, which was a post-operative brace used in polio. But its post-operative curve correction led to its some wider applications. Uh, like on uh, the Navy training models for their scoliosis, the Barbie doll. So there are a variety of different brace types, Milwaukee, Boston, Charleston, and the others have all been studied to some degree. And they're really all, for the most part, a, a variation on a the theme of a TLSO. This is a Providence brace. This is just a TLSO. Another Providence brace. The Charleston brace, the bending brace at night. Boston brace. So the history of the bracing, uh, there have been roughly 25 studies that show bracing is effective in controlling the progression and decreasing the likelihood of surgery. There have been six studies that show that bracing is not effective at all, uh, but none of these studies have really been well defined or well designed. So poorly designed that uh, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force in 93 stated that Really, there are inadequate evidence to determine whether brace therapy limits the natural progression of the disease in a significant proportion of cases. And that the Scoliosis Research Society echoed that, and they tried to standardize criteria for the adolescent idiopathic scoliosis brace studies. These are just a variety of the different studies that have been done showing uh, bracing, for the most part, works. Some, some of the studies show it doesn't work. So the general guidelines for research that the SRS came up was that there should be uniform inclusion criteria, that the patients uh, should be probably less than 10, risks are 0 to 2, and a 25 to 40 degree primary curve, and no previous treatment. And in order to assess the brace effectiveness, they should look at the percentage of patients with less than 5 degrees of progression or greater than 6 de degrees of progression, the percentage of patients that have had surgery, the percentage of patients who progress beyond 45 degrees, and they should all have a minimum of two years of follow-up. But despite the fact that we don't have good uh, bracing studies, per se, the SRS still has guidelines for treatment, and that is progression uh, to greater than 25 degrees or 30 degrees at the presentation in a risk of 0 to 3 really is something that should be treated with a brace. So, really to address the bracing versus natural history, uh, the natural history, again, is fairly well um, followed and understood, but not, not completely uh, validated by science. Bracing is the same. It's whether uh, your personal preference is to embrace bracing or not. Uh, what is important is to follow the patient 
and allow them to declare their own natural history. And that's it. Thanks a lot. Well, that certainly gives us the luxury of time. Thank you for that concise uh, summary. Um, we do have some time for questions, and uh, all of our, uh, our speakers uh, can certainly be asked a question. I'd like to start off with a question to, to, to James. Um, the, the, and, and I guess, you know, just being a simple spine surgeon, I, I need a, a, a take-home message. How, how is what the, the, the aspects of the etiology that you discussed where, where are those going to go in terms of our treatment? Well, I think if uh, you can pick out a particular group genetically um, who you can predict are going to progress, then you might want to um, treat them much earlier before the curve gets into the 30, 40, 50 degrees. Um, and you may be able to predict who you can brace, uh, who you can treat with non-fusion surgery, and who you, can who you have to treat with fusion. So I, I think that's really where the, where the interest is in the future. Um, uh, in being able to predict how you treat people, who needs treating when, and then, of course, in developing new techniques which don't involve fusing the spine. Do you see any interaction between uh, biologic agents and perhaps, in, uh, perhaps slowing down uh, asymmetric growth curves or, or uh, uh, inherent spinal growth asymmetries in the future? I, I just don't see biologic agents being effective uh, in scoliosis as, as the science is at the moment. But it would be great if you could just inject something into the concave side and make it grow. <laughs> Question there. With the model that you showed with the anterior column and the posterior tension band, when you lengthen the anterior column, then it bulges onto one side. Common sense would tell you that it should bend, uh, if, if you did it a certain number of times, it should bend equally to the right and to the left. Do you think it's the presence of the heart, or how do you explain the fact that the majority of curves are apex right? I, I don't think there's any um, good explanation for that. I mean, people have always said it's because of the aorta or the heart pushing the spine over. Um, certainly in the model, you, you can't predict which way it's going to go um, that, because obviously the model doesn't have any uh, asymmetry at all. But there must be some asymmetry in the spine which makes it, tends to make it go to the right rather than to, than to the left. I wanted to add a little bit to, uh, to the earlier question about the bracing and... Uh, and scoliosis. We had a very exciting meeting this year in which Dr. Ogilvy extended the work on the Mormon population to now 3,300 patients. And uh, he was able, using five genetic markers, to predict those people who will develop a scoliosis greater than 40 degrees or will never develop a scoliosis of 40 degrees. And this is within 95% accuracy. Now, this is really exciting because if that occurs, the whole world of bracing will change. Because if you have a curve that's not going to get worse, you certainly wouldn't brace them. And if you have a curve that's predictably bad, then you will operate very early. And so I think there's going to be a revolution in our thinking about uh, scoliosis treatment. And it may help to explain why we have such poor controlled bracing studies. And uh, so I just add that. Well, I, and on that same line, I'd like to ask the, uh, the problem that we've dealing with patients. And the, the, one of the issues always is, how do you get people to wear these things? Uniformly, compliance has been a problem in the studies. And they've had uh, implantable things on the brace that you can tell what the compliance has been. And it's been 10% in some studies and, and lower. And, and bracing isn't necessarily benign. Maybe physiologically, it can be benign. But psychologically, it's not. In a younger patient with a pliable chest, it's not necessarily benign sometimes either. So I, it's, you know, I guess rigid parents is probably the best way to get kids to wear a brace, but it's certainly a struggle. I have a question for Greg. Um, as a basic parameter, uh, where of a TLSO in any population, how much is it expected to decrease pulmonary function? Well, that's a good question. Uh, it, it will reduce it to variable extents depending on how much you allow the abdomen to move. So one of the things to think about is that as you brace someone, uh, the only place where you can really move with a brace, if you're really controlling chest wall, is going to be the abdomen. And that's where your diaphragm, actually have room to let your diaphragm go down. Depending on how you construct, how you construct that, if you reduce abdominal excursion, you get a lot of distress, and kids won't wear it because of that. So 
lot of it's in the, in the in how it's constructed. Uh, people overlook the, di the abdomen a lot in terms of how patients tolerate this. You're going to reduce uh, vital capacity, and you know people have estimated because you have reduced vital capacity already. If you say how much more do you do it, 10 percent, 20 percent easily, depending on the patient and how severe they are. Uh, do you have an idea of the status of bracing in, in England for children at the moment? It's just a curiosity, really. Do you think that a lot of surgeons have abandoned bracing altogether? I think uh, the majority of surgeons have abandoned bracing, but uh, certainly in our center we still use it widely, and we would use the uh, SRS criteria. Um, I thought it was interesting, though, that the criteria for investigation for the SRS was um, they, they, wanted, they, they were suggesting that we only... Uh, do clinical trials on much younger patients, and yet the the, our, the majority of our patients are um, sort of risk grade naught to three, but a lot of them are grade two and three, and that's precisely the group that we want to know whether we can brace or not. I think we we know that the very young children respond very well to bracing. <music>